We've learned that magnetic fields are created by moving electric charges, that magnetic fields exert forces on moving electric charges, and that changing magnetic fields can do work on electric charges. But we haven't learned about any special effects of changing electric fields. Changing electric fields do have magnetic effects, and they are indeed special. The interplay between changing electric and magnetic fields creates one of the most fundamental ways that we interact with our environment electromagnetic radiation. We are familiar with electromagnetic radiation as light and radio waves traveling through space. Now I'd like to tell you just what it is and how it affects matter. First, let's consider what happens inside a parallel plate capacitor. Long ago I told you that electric charge is conserved and that one way charge conservation manifests itself is in Kirchhoff's current rule. At any point in a circuit, the current in equals the current out. Charge won't build up anywhere, there is no source of current, and no charge is ever destroyed. But what about a capacitor? Positive charge builds up on one plate, and negative charge builds up on the other plate. Current goes into the capacitor, charging the positive plate, and out of the capacitor, charging the negative plate. The actual charge carriers, the electrons, move in the opposite direction, but the effect is the same. But what is happening at one of the plates? Is the current coming in, going out? What about between the plates? No charges move there. Does that mean there's no current between the plates? Well, James Clark Maxwell wondered about that. He recognized that a constant current through a capacitor meant a constant rate of accumulation of charge on the plates. And that, in turn, meant a constant rate of increase in the electric field strength between the plates. So a current through a capacitor means a changing electric field inside the capacitor. In a capacitor, a current is manifested as a changing electric field. Perhaps, reasoned Maxwell, a changing electric field is an electric current. After all, how do you create a changing electric field? By depleting one sign of charge in one location, and accumulating them somewhere else. That change in the spatial distribution of charge over time is exactly a current. So Maxwell defined the current equivalence of a change in electric field. It's the vacuum permittivity epsilon naught times the rate of change of electric flux through some closed loop. As an aside, electric flux is completely analogous to magnetic flux. It's the electric field strength multiplied by the cross-section of the loop. Is this a real current or just an accounting trick? Well, a real current, as we know, sets up a magnetic field circulating around itself. So does a changing electric field. We know all about that field. We can even figure out its direction. So this looks awfully familiar. Not long ago, we learned of Faraday's law which tells us that a changing magnetic flux through a closed loop creates something like an electric field that pushes charges around the loop. Now we learn that a changing electric field through a closed loop creates a magnetic field around the loop. What does this tell us? Moving electric charges create a magnetic field. A changing magnetic field, which must be created by accelerating electric charges, creates an electric field. Do they create each other and reinforce each other? Yes. Yes, they do. When an electric and magnetic field reinforce each other this way, their amplitudes are directly proportional to each other. The constant of proportionality, C, is a velocity, as the units require. Recall, electric field units are newtons per coulomb, and magnetic field units are Newton seconds per coulomb meter, which is newtons per coulomb divided by meters per second. So this constant c turns out not to just to be any velocity, it's the speed of light. We've also already seen that the electric field created by a changing magnetic flux is perpendicular, circulating around the magnetic field. We also know that the magnetic field created by an electric current including the displacement current of a changing electric flux, is perpendicular, circling around the current. 
the electric and magnetic fields are mutually perpendicular and perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Propagation? Yes, indeed. These self-propagating electromagnetic fields travel through space. Maxwell discovered this mathematically. He derived that these fields would travel through space with a speed that was given by a combination of the electric permittivity epsilon naught and the magnetic permeability mu naught. He calculated the value and recognized it as the speed of light for which a reliable value had only recently been measured. Could it be, he wondered, that light traveled at this speed because light is an electromagnetic wave? I have to pause here and wonder what that must have felt like. To be the first human, the first person in the world to know what light is. Now, that is an accomplishment. By Maxwell's time, light had been recognized to be a wave, and physicists had a decent idea of what its wavelength range was. Maxwell realized that these electromagnetic waves shouldn't be restricted to that small range, and predicted that there should be many more wavelengths that our eyes can't see. We just needed to find ways to generate and to detect them. The propagation speed of electromagnetic waves in a vacuum is now recognized as a fundamental physical constant. In fact, it's now defined as 299,792,458 meters per second. That constant, together with the definition of the second, defines the length of the meter. Here's a representation of an electromagnetic wave propagating through space, represented as a snapshot at one moment in time. The wave is oscillating electric and magnetic fields, perpendicular to each other and to their direction of propagation. It turns out that the direction of propagation is the same as the direction of the cross product E cross B. Notice, as E, the electric field, and B, the magnetic field, oscillate, the direction of their cross product is constant. The variations in field strength travel at the speed of light. Now, all the waves we have studied before now are oscillations in position of some medium. A rope, the surface of water, a slinky. That suggests that electric and magnetic fields are oscillations of some electromagnetic medium. But alas, clever experiments by brilliant physicists have never found any trace of such a luminiferous ether. The concept of the ether was dealt a death blow by Einstein's special theory of relativity at the beginning of the 20th century. But it turns out that the idea hasn't disappeared completely. It's now conceptually the foundation of the idea of quantum field theory. Speaking of quantum theory, it turns out that as successful as Maxwell's theory was at describing the behavior of electromagnetic radiation, it was utterly incapable of predicting the energy that these waves transported. Classically, the wave energy should be proportional to the square of the wave amplitude. But experimentally, the energy of electromagnetic waves was found to be proportional instead to the frequency of the wave. The formula is that energy equals h times the frequency with h being a universal constant, now known as Planck's constant. If this moving wave has energy, why not momentum too? Electromagnetic wave momentum is also proportional to Planck's constant, and, well, proportional to the frequency too. But the actual proportion is that the momentum is inversely proportional to wavelength. These realizations turned out to be fundamental to the quantum mechanical understanding of matter as well as light. Subatomic particles, such as electrons and quarks, also have frequencies proportional to their energies and wavelengths inversely proportional to their momentum. These particles behave in much the same way as light waves do. In a very real sense, there are no particles, there are only fields. Now, back to electromagnetic waves. As Maxwell predicted, but did not live to observe, electromagnetic radiation comes in all sizes. The waves range from radio waves, which are meters long, to gamma rays, which can be as short as the diameters of atomic nuclei. We've classified wavelength ranges into groups based on their effects on matter and how the radiation is produced. 
we generate radio waves and microwaves by rapidly alternating electric currents. Infrared, through ultraviolet radiation, is often thermal radiation. The temperature of matter is correlated to the kinetic energy of its molecules, with high temperature meaning higher energy. Since matter is composed of charged particles, when they bounce around, the resulting changing electric fields create changing magnetic fluxes, and so on. The more energy the charges have, the faster they oscillate, and the more energetic the radiation they emit. X-rays are produced when an energetic beam of electrons slams into a metal barrier. Gamma rays are emitted when excited atomic nuclei decay to a lower energy state. 